Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. It is our pleasure to welcome back to the show the Athletics' Bruce Feldman. Uh, wrote a great piece wrapping up his winners and losers, if you will, of the NFL draft uh, and had the commanders as a team whose draft he really liked. Uh, Bruce, appreciate your time as always, and let's dive right in. What did you like so much about what Adam Peters did in his first draft in charge in Washington? You know, I think the first and foremost, this is going to make sound like a duh statement, but I think he drafted some, you know, terrific college football players first and foremost and guys who were um, super productive and guys who I think translate well to the NFL. I mean, you start with the Heisman Trophy winner, Jaden Daniels, who got better and better and better throughout his career. Um, he's a guy, coaches are very effusive about how he plays, what they see from him character wise. Um, I think it'll be, I think it's going to be a good fit with Cliff Kingsbury, and I'm excited to see what. He can do there in Washington. Obviously, he has some good weapons, you know, with Terry McLaurin and John Dotson and Zach Ertz. And I think they they added to that with with um, you know Ben Sinnott from from K State, who's very talented and really underrated. And I think that's a that's a lot to work with with a really dynamic quarterback who can who is a passer first, but is so dangerous as a runner as well. So, Bruce, obviously, for those that don't know you, uh, they're missing out on, on great college football coverage, but Bruce uh, covers college football during the year, and obviously the, the worlds merge during the draft. And I, I want to kind of circle back to that first part, that dust statement, because it's, it's not a dust statement. The idea of drafting like super productive guys in college. As you cover this, the, the draft being this, through the lens of someone who watches these guys play in college, have you been able to, over your career, like really have a, a formula or a way, whatever you want to call it, of picking out the guys you think will translate that are productive at college versus, hey, that's that's working in college. I don't know if that is going to translate into the NFL level. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a difference between like NFL open and college open when it comes to quarterbacks in terms of throwing the receivers and the offense, how it translates. I mean, Jaden Daniels, I'll say this, you know, the coaches for Blue saw like my draft confidential on the athletic of, you know, a few weeks ago, like, one thing that stood out to a lot of the coaches is, you know, the closest comparison to them, it's not a fair comparison because it's, you know, an NFL MVP kind of quarterback, but is is Lamar Jackson in terms of just being such a dangerous runner. Um, Jaden's not as strong as, as Lamar, but he is a very dynamic runner. And the thing that, that coaches come back to is he's playing in the SEC. He is running away from really fast guys. Uh, will he run away from everybody in the NFL? No, but will he run away from a lot of guys? He, I mean, this isn't like Tim Tebow running. This is a guy who is really dynamic now. He's not a huge frame guy. He's he's wiry still, and he's probably put on 40 pounds since uh, you know he got to Arizona State. But you know, he's got to make smarter decisions. But then you you look at some of these other guys. I mean, Johnny Newton from Illinois is a very disruptive defensive tackle. Everybody I know thinks he is going to, to be a big force for Washington in the NFL, and he's going to be a big problem for guards to try and block. You look at Mike Hussein or still the nickel from Michigan. I mean, he had as much to do with that program changing and getting to be a national title as, uh, winner as any player that, that was there. I mean, he, he, he is a little undersized. There's no doubt about that. But he is so quick and instinctive. He blitzes well. He's a really good tackler. He's a ball hawk. Um, you know, I think he'll be a great addition to to Washington. I mean, that translates. And I, I feel like it is just – I feel like it's just a group where you kind of look through and like, okay, there's other – you know, Luke McCaffrey is going to be an interesting addition. Jordan McGee, I know scouts really liked him. Uh, Dominique Hampton has a lot of athleticism. This is a really, really good, um, good group that they added. Yeah, a lot of guys that uh, have that college production you talked about, but also the athletic upside where you wonder, like, 
Uh, are they even close to their best football yet? Uh, for a guy like Daniels, obviously his best football so far was last year, far and away. As someone who watched him from Arizona State through LSU, when did you start hearing stories out of that LSU program of some kind of light clicking on for him and that maybe they were on to something and that Jaden was on to something to have the kind of year that he ultimately had and, and that ended in the Heisman Trophy? Really uh, around this time last year, because I talked to some of the coaches I know there and some of the staff, and they were so effusive in his work ethic and how sharp he is. And, you know, he really embraced the VR technology that that LSU staff had partnered with that was from an international group. And they feel like that made a big improvement in him and how he sees defenses. And he was really good at that. And he was accurate. Um, you know, he doesn't have the same level of juice in his arm that, that Penix has or that even Caleb has. But he has enough arm. And, again, I think one thing that people, like, maybe hold against him a little bit is he had two first-round receivers he was throwing to, and he had a really good offensive line. There's a couple of potential high-round draft picks next year who are on that offensive line. But again, he was doing it against really talented defenses, and you just saw him continue to get better and better. Like, he was good at Arizona State, but he wasn't anywhere near like this. And he was playing in a program that was in disarray under Herm Edwards. It was a, it was a, you know, such a mess. He got to LSU, it was Brian Kelly's first year, and he really kept them from, you know, turned them into a team that could play for the SEC championship, you know, and then he got better as a passer. I just, you know, hats off to him because, again, I think a year ago at this time, no one was expecting him to be the top five draft pick. Maybe he would be like a first three rounds guy because I think people like his athleticism and some of the other stuff that he brings, but just as a passer, he just blossomed. Yeah, uh, Bruce Feldman. Of course, college football writer at The Athletic is with us. His draft confidential is a must-read leading up to the draft and then uh, published a post-draft draft confidential uh, with some some of the drafts he liked, which included Washington. And in part, Bruce, a guy you already mentioned, because uh, because Adam Peters took your favorite player in this draft and Mike Sainer still. What's your favorite Mike Sainer still story from Michigan? Um, so two years ago, so Michigan had, had uh, you know, Urban Meyer famously 7-0 and against Michigan, and that's the biggest rivalry game there. And um, it was 2021. Michigan finally, finally knocks off Ohio State at Ann Arbor. Well, the year, the next year, the game is at Ohio State. I think a lot of, most Ohio State folks thought, oh, it was really fluky. It was a snow game. It was this and that. You know, they have, going into the game, Ohio State has, um, T.J. Stroud, Michigan has a first-year starting quarterback in J.J. McCarthy. Michigan is really banged up coming to the game. Blake Corum really was a non-factor. They had about six other players who were who were really banged up. And Michigan almost got blown out of the game in the first half. They were hanging around, hanging around. And I'm on the sideline for Fox, and I'm, uh, you know, along with my colleague Tom Rinaldi, you know, we're like just kind of out on the Michigan sideline and I'm standing there and it's, you know, deep into the second half and the game is hanging in the balance. And I see St. still stand up on top of their bench, brings every Michigan defensive player, not just the starters around him and gives this impassioned speech. He's pointing at the Ohio State sideline from, you know, from Michigan sideline. You know, we know who they are. We're going to make them quit right now. And keeps, I mean, he is just, it's like a, it's almost like a religious speech. Like, you know, he is so amped up. And, you know, even thinking about it now, hearing it, I'm like getting goosebumps. Like, this goes on and on. And from that point on, they dominated the second half and blew Ohio State out. And I remember telling that story on our podcast, um, you know, like a few days later, it was one of the one of the most surreal moments I've seen. You know, I did sideline for a long time at Fox, of being on the sideline of college games. But in that in that moment, and so you know, I, I tweeted out a link to a story I did about Michigan, and in it is that speech. Um, so for people who want to know what why um, this guy is more than just a really 
terrific defensive back, why he is like off the charts and tangibles. Go look at my Twitter feed, find the link to that, that Mikey Sainer still speech and story, and you'll get it. You'll be like, okay. You know, like I saw, you know, because I posted it online, I noticed a uh, commander's fan had said, man, he feels a lot like he could be the defense of Terry McLaurin. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, that's not a bad comparison because, like, Terry McLaurin, again, like, I remember being at Ohio State for some interviews for TV, and Ohio State had a great receiver room at that point with, like, great character guys. There was a – very rarely do you find, like, a, a team that's leadership group is the receiving room. But that group had uh, Paris Campbell, it had McLaurin, it had another guy named Johnny Dixon. And I remember telling one of the um, – staffers at Ohio State. I was like, man, can't be like, who else do you want to talk to? I was like, well, I want Johnny and I definitely want Paris because I had dealt with them a bunch and I got to know both of them a little bit. And I remember one of them was like, look, if you like those guys, you'll love Terry. We'll get you Terry too. I said, okay, great. Um, and I was like, man, if, if, if you're saying that, because I know how, um, how like genuine and sharp those other two guys are, and then obviously Terry McLaurin's been everything in that, and, and then some, you know, since he's been a, in the NFL. So again, that's probably whoever made it. I don't remember who the who the the reader was, but yeah, I don't I, I don't disagree with that comparison at all. Yeah, it's some something that I think a lot of us have said. Uh, it's because we're so familiar with Terry and what he does. I mean, I was on the beat and when he got drafted in 2019, still. And just remember that training camp distinctly, kind of being like, this is this guy was supposed to be the best special teams player in the draft. I don't know that he's ever going to play special teams for, for Washington. I think he's going to be their number one receiver. And sure enough, uh, that's what happened. And I think the thing, Bruce, that I find so interesting and fascinating and exciting about that St. Russell story is he is like, he, he would have been in his first year as a corner at that point to gather the defense like that. Cause he was, a, he was a receiver as you well know. And then, spot, end, yeah. yeah. And then end of his first season, he's doing that gather, gathering the defense. I think it just speaks to how well respected he was within the room pretty instantly. And, and you know, he's got that upside to continue growing as a corner. Cause he's only been doing it for like two years. Yeah. And coaches just sort of loved him and he just has like a spark about him. Like you see him walking around. And I've used this analogy before where, he looks like a, a grad student when he wears his glasses, like a law student, school student or something, because he's <laughs> not very big. Yeah. Um, he's really bright, but then you watch him on the field, and he's like, it's like a glow to him. You know, he made great one on one tackles in space. He picked off a lot of passes. Like, you know, it, it also in that game, by the way, in that Ohio State game, he makes perhaps the biggest play of the game where Cade Stover, their big tight end, is on, he's on him in the corner of the end zone. He knocks the ball out of Cade Stover's hands and makes a play where, you know, it's a good throw and he just makes a better play and saves a touchdown for them. And again, I, I cannot say enough good things about him. Uh, you can read more good things from Bruce Feldman about Mike Sanders still, in, in fact, uh, in The Athletic. Uh, and, and check out, uh, of course, uh, that link that he referenced on Twitter uh, if you want to see and hear more about that speech he gave against Ohio State. Bruce, always great to catch up, man. Your, your insight is uh, invaluable, and we appreciate you sharing it uh, here on The Hoffman Show. Oh, it's good to talk to you. I appreciate the time. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.